hope beyond our sorrow. Healer of our every ill, light of each tomorrow, give us peace beyond our beyond our Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship at St. Mark's on this Mother's Day in church land. It's also known as Christian Family Sunday, so we are all included in that. And so a very happy Mother's Day Christian Family Sunday to you all. Uh, a special welcome to those of you who may be worshiping with us for the first time. I know we have some old friends from our Treya United Church here, Pat and Gray, and, uh, and their kids. So it's great to have you worshiping with us. And Doug, Harvey, it's great to see you back too, fresh from, uh, from some surgery. So it's good to have you back. So for all of you who are mothers or grandmothers uh, or like a mother or a grandmother to someone, I will wish you a very happy day today. Following the service, there are some flowers that are for um, all the women in the congregation and the members of the session will be handing them out as you leave. So don't sneak out the back door or you won't get your flower. <laughs> Um, I think it's important to realize that this day can also be very bittersweet as we remember those who long to be mothers, uh, those who are unable to conceive or who have experienced miscarriage or those who have lost children. This day will be a difficult one for them and so I would encourage you to remember them in your prayers as well. Here at St. Mark's we worship on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, specifically the Ojibwe and Chippewa peoples. This land is covered by the Jay Collins Land Purchase and Lake Simcoe Treaty 16. I think it's important that we take a little bit of time to uh, ponder how we have lived up to those treaties and how we are working on living in right relationship with the original peoples who have stewarded this land for centuries. Uh, it is my hope that we can all uh, live up to our calling to be good treaty people. There are a couple of special days in the congregation to celebrate this week. It is Charlie Harvey's birthday today, and it is Zoe's birthday on Thursday, and she's going to be I was going to say 14. She's going to be 15. Oh my goodness. You may remember Zoe from her stellar performance um, uh, as Jairus' daughter on Good Friday. So it, uh, we will sing to Charlie and Zoe and wish them a happy birthday. This week, uh, Knit One, Pray Two is on Tuesday morning. Uh, there's a board meeting Tuesday at 7 o'clock, and the men's breakfast is happening at Barnfield Point at 9 o'clock on Wednesday. Um, and this week, there's no choir practice because Terry's taking a well-deserved week off. I heard that her Hawkstone Singers uh, concert on Saturday night was an absolute smash smashing success. <laughs> 
It was entitled The British Are Coming. <laughs> so so um, no choir this week, but they'll be back next week. Um, Irene, are there... Oh, and uh, I wanted to remind you all about our Vacation Bible Camp that's coming up uh, starting uh, on August the 24th. First, I believe um, it's there's out uh, there's a uh, more details about it on this little blue sheet that's at the front door. If you would like to um, volunteer, and we can't do it without volunteers, um, you can sign up on the sheet. It could be to bring snack, it could be to sing some songs, it could be to tell a Bible story, it could just be to be an extra pair of hands for our wonderful crafts that we'll be doing. It's only during the mornings of that week, so it's not too onerous, and uh, it generally is a lot of fun. So I hope that uh, we can have some, uh, a lot of people uh, make light work. So many, many hands make light work. So I hope we have lots of people who can volunteer for that week. Are there any other announcements, Irene? Do you have registration for right. So for any of you who have children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren who might like to come, uh, you can get the registration forms. Um, they're in a packet uh, on the bulletin board downstairs. You can talk to me. You can talk to Irene. You can talk to Lori. <laughs> um, and I would encourage you to do that. So that's it for announcements. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Peter Riddell to come forward and do our good news segment today. Uh, as you know, I wife Dorothy unfortunately had a fall several weeks ago and broke both her hips. That meant we had to enter the healthcare system. And as you had heard, we had heard about many stories about how difficult that system was and how it was suffering from shortages and of staff and so on. I want to let you know that in our case, it was a happy story. Uh, Dorothy was quickly picked up uh, by the paramedics. Uh, she, we, uh, she went to the hospital on Friday morning, uh, was, was in a room on the surgical floor before noon on that Friday, and her surgery was, happened the following day. The surgeon delayed because he wanted to do some exploring. He had not experienced a double hip fracture and he wanted to take time to consult with colleagues. And he shared with us on the Saturday morning before Dorothy went in for her surgery that even his senior colleagues had never experienced one of these in their practice. But he, he did this both on the same day on Saturday, and she has continued in her recovery. Uh, the various uh, wards she was in uh, in the hospital uh, were well staffed and well, and the staff seemed to be happy. I, th I thought that was a, a, a remarkable thing because we hear otherwise. And I've heard in part from somebody the reason for that is the excellent leadership that is being given by the administrator of our hospital. He apparently has made a, a sea change in the atmosphere in the hospital since he took over responsibility. So that's another good thing to know. Uh, Dorothy has now moved out of the hospital into a surge bed. Uh, these beds were created during COVID, actually, to take pressure off the hospital. Um, and happily for us, the surge bed is in the building next door to where we live. So it's now very easy for uh, me to go back and forth and uh, participate in uh, Dorothy's life. And... Uh, on uh, the nice days we've had, I've been able to bring her across to our building so she can visit with some of uh, uh, the people with whom she was living before this all happened. Anyways, I, I, I just thought it was good to let you know that, um, yeah, there are good things happening in our healthcare system and particularly here in, in uh, uh, Orillia. Thank you. <laughs> I'll pay you later, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> <That's free. laughs>
<laughs> Thank you, Peter. And that is indeed good news that Dorothy is doing so well. And I can tell you, from my perspective as her minister, every time I went to visit her, it was an uplifting experience for me because she is a woman of such deep faith and that never wavered during her time in the hospital and during her recovery. So it's all good news. So thanks, Peter. Let's take a moment now just to quiet our hearts and our minds as we prepare to worship God together. Come and see the works of God, God's awesome deeds among us. Come and hear all who revere God, God's still speaking voice in our weary world. Come and touch the sacred, the extraordinary in the ordinary. Come and let us worship God together. I'm going to invite you to join in singing our introit, Let There Be Love Shared Among Us, which is number 73 in the St. Mark's Songbook. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, we gather to celebrate your presence with us, to offer you our praise and our prayers, our love and our obedience. Through the gift of your own spirit, you abide with us and in us. We rejoice in your love for us and in the life we've been given through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. Open our eyes to recognize your presence here among us. Open our hearts to the love that you have for us. Open our minds to the truth you would reveal to us. All glory and praise to you, O God, now and forevermore. O God, you have placed us here on this earth and sustained our beings through the produce of the land and the cleanness of the air we breathe. You have made us for each to tend and care for the weak, and in share a just sharing of this earth's resources. But it seems that we are a part of a proud and hard-hearted people who hoard what the earth provides. We seem loath to share the fruits of our labors. We live for today with little thought for tomorrow, and we are afraid to let the pain and suffering of others affect us. O oh God, you know us in our innermost beings. In your grace, we pray that you would offer to us forgiveness, even before we have the chance to articulate our sorrow. You embrace us in all of our sinfulness, and in doing so, you give us the chance to start again, to learn from the example you have given us in Jesus, who chose the way of the cross, that all might know the depth of your love for all that you have made. Spirit of God, open our hearts and our minds that we may grasp your forgiveness. And being forgiven, seek to forgive others and to live a life of reconciling love modeled on the example of Jesus Christ, in whose name we make this prayer. Amen. Friends, hear the good news we find in the Gospel. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. And even at this very moment, Christ is praying for each and every one of us. 
So believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven and we are set free to live more fully through God's generous grace. Thanks be to God for this wonderful gift. Amen. Our first hymn is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. That's number 371 in the Book of Praise. And we're going to sing verses 1, 3, 4, and 5, I believe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> This weekend, earlier this weekend, I was able to spend some time with my girls and their kids at a friend's cottage a little bit north of here. It's a beautiful spot and it has a fabulous view of a lake. And we can go to that picture now. <laughs> Barb's waiting this time. <laughs> So Friday night, we were treated to this superb sunset. You may have noticed it wherever you happen to be on Friday night. And William, who is seven years old, we were, and I, we were standing out on the deck looking at this view, taking it all in, and he turned to me, and he, was, he just had this wonder in his voice, and he said to me, he said, you mean this? is here all the time? <laughs> 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 
I said, yes, it's here all the time. And he said, wow, it's so beautiful. And he was just in awe. And he was right because it was beautiful, not just because of the you know, colors of the, the beautiful sunset, but because of the nature that surrounded us. And as often my grandchildren do, they, that got me thinking. And it got me thinking about how many gifts surround us all the time that we just don't stop and notice. We're too busy to notice, aren't we? Not only the spectacular gifts of nature that I particularly enjoy, but other gifts of God. And one of those gifts of God is something that we're going to be talking more about today, and that is the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit who is always with us and always within us. And I wonder how often we think about that or recognize that or indeed give thanks for that gift. But we should because it is a gift that Jesus himself gave to us, to his disciples and to all of his disciples, and that includes us. And so I would encourage you to notice and be grateful, certainly for the visible gifts that surround us, but also for the sometimes less tangible and visible gifts that God gives to us each and every day. And I hope that like William, you will be able to say, wow, this is here all the time. And it is. So let's, uh, let's practice our gratitude. Amen. And our hymn is Savior, Teach Me Day by Day. And perhaps that is what the Savior can teach us day by day is to be grateful. As we prepare to hear the word of God, let us ask for guidance uh, to open our hearts and minds to that. Let us pray. Spirit of truth and love, move in us and among us as we listen for the scriptures read and proclaimed and sung. Open our minds and hearts to God's living word so that we may know it more fully and follow it more faithfully day by day. Amen.
That was indescribable. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was, be yeah, I know that. We didn't talk to each other before that, so that, that worked out well. <laughs> yes? Uh, yes, so this, this, um, this is an ongoing saga here <laughs> of our heat. And uh, I will look for the mode, and let's see what we've got here. Cool. And then, okay, let me know how that goes. I've set it at 74. Do we think that'll be okay, or do we want it hotter? You, well, no, I, I've, I've set it to cool, 274, I think. <laughs> Again, if I see you taking your clothes off, I'll know you're too hot. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Listen now for the word of the Lord. <laughs> we are reading today from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 15 to 21. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. In the name of God the Father, our Creator, God the Son, our Redeemer, and God the Spirit, our Sustainer. Amen. Well, last week, you may recall, we read together the first 14 verses of the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. And as I reminded you at that time, John is recalling the last night of Jesus' life, the night we now know as Maundy Thursday. And a side note, several people have asked me why we call it Maundy Thursday. Well, the word comes from the Latin word modatum, or command, which refers to the instructions that Jesus gave to his disciples that night as they celebrated the Passover supper together. And it's helpful, I think, to remember that Jesus wasn't making suggestions to his disciples. We don't call it Suggestion Thursday. He was issuing commands to them about how they were to live their lives. And they would be living their lives without him going forward. Because he reminded them that he was going to be leaving them. He had told them of his death numerous times. And they would soon need to figure things out on their own without him nearby to constantly advise them and correct them. And he tells them, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus refers to his father a number of times, all in the context of his coming death. And he tells his disciples he's going to his father's house, that he is the way to the father. Now, Philip said to Jesus earlier in the chapter, show us the father and we will be satisfied. And Jesus replied, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? Well, I wonder if Jesus might have been thinking to himself, I am so much like my father that if he were standing here instead of me, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between us. What he tells me to say, I say. 
What he tells me to do, I do. My words are his words. My works are his works. If you've seen me, you've seen him. And if you've loved me, well, you're really going to love him. And perhaps that made the disciples feel a little bit better. I suspect that all the talk of Jesus' imminent death has left them feeling distressed and anxious. And that's all very understandable. Jesus has already told them, if you remember, not to worry, that he was going to prepare a place for them. But they're still upset and they're afraid. And so he tells them that he will not leave them orphaned or abandoned or alone. Instead, he will send to them what has been translated as advocate. And this advocate is the Holy Spirit. Actually, the word that John uses is parakletos. It's often, as I said, translated as advocate, but it can have several different but similar meanings. It's a hard word to pin down. It, as I said, can function in a legal sense, meaning literally one who advocates for you before a court of law, or it could be in a more relational sense by describing one who brings help and consolation and comfort and encouragement. All of these, however, exist side by side with the most basic meaning of the word, which is to come alongside another. To come alongside another. Jesus actually says that he will send to them another advocate who will be with them forever. Because Jesus himself was the first advocate. Jesus who comes alongside every single one of us through the incarnation so that we might come to know and see an otherwise invisible God. Jesus is promising to his disciples that he will not leave them alone, they will not be orphaned, that he will be in them and they will be in him. And that will happen through the gift of this spirit who will remain with them and with us forever. Now, sometimes when we think of the spirit, I think we tend to imagine a very individual and personal connection with God, with a feeling of individual security and warmth and peace. And that's very comforting. We think of the spirit as gentle. We even sing a hymn about that, Spirit of Gentleness. And I would say that all these ways of describing the Spirit are accurate, but the Spirit isn't limited to the way we can define the Spirit in our own minds. The Spirit is a force on the move, just as Jesus was during his earthly ministry. I want you to think about it. Jesus ate with outcasts and sinners. He cleansed the temple of money changers and those cheating the poor. He healed and he preached and he fed the hungry. He was a man of action. He was always on the move. He was traveling back and forth between Galilee and Jerusalem during his whole ministry. And I think when we remember that, we can recognize the spirit on the move among us, of Jesus dwelling in and among us. To have seen Jesus at work is to anticipate the work of the Holy Spirit. The Jesus we see in the Gospels operates not by himself, but in community with his disciples and with the many people that he serves. One commentator, Linda Lee Clater, says, The story of Jesus is not about Jesus and a single disciple, like some stories of prophets or holy men from other traditions. Jesus is present and active with groups of people, real people who sometimes struggle just to get along and other times enjoy sharing their successes, their hopes, and their questions. So when Jesus promises to be in his disciples and promises that they will be in him, it seems clear now that he cannot be promising only mystical union with individuals, 
Everything we know about him suggests someone operating as an active presence in a communal context. Now, I do firmly believe that we are each called to have a personal relationship with Jesus, but I also firmly believe that we are each called to live that out in community. We are called to be with others, to move among them just as Jesus did. We are called to live and to love as Jesus did. And here's how that looked in Jesus' life feeding the hungry, not being afraid to touch the leper, healing the sick, comforting the grieving, treating the outcast with respect and care, acknowledging women and slaves as equals. Love in Jesus' life was lived out as service and compassion, recognizing the value of all people, regardless of their social status. For Jesus, it truly was all about relationships. And that is how we are called to live out the love that Jesus promises to us, that he will be in us and that we will be in him and we will all together be in God. Have you ever considered that perhaps each one of us is being called to be a parakletos, to each other, by coming alongside one another, not only in good times, but perhaps more importantly in challenging times, perhaps like the times in which we live. Might we in this way truly become a community of the Spirit? Might we in fact recognize that in coming alongside each other, to be each other's advocates, we are loving Jesus most fully as he did by keeping his commandments. I don't think I need to remind you that Jesus had commanded his disciples to love one another just as Jesus had loved them. Now, in addition to showing love as individuals, I believe that we are called to show love as a community of faith. We are called to advocate on others' behalf as a church. We are to preach and teach messages of love. We are to advocate through the hospitality we show to all, and I do mean all. We also show love as a church outside of the church building, being a public witness of God's love. I believe we are called to help to dismantle systems that keep people in poverty by advocating for human rights for everyone. We are called to listen to the people in our own community who have been rendered voiceless in our society. We're called to journey with people as they seek to grow deeper in their faith, in their relationship with God and their neighbor. And as a church, we are called to create disciples of love. Think back to the introit we sang at the beginning of the service. We were asking God that there would be love shared among us. And I think that is a beautiful description of a community filled by the Spirit. Over the last few years, we have lived through a curious time. For most of us, the years of the pandemic were unlike any that we had ever experienced before. I think it was, in some ways, a gift. It was also very challenging. But in some ways, it was a gift because we were given the opportunity as a world to pause We were given the gift of time to consider what is truly important. Now, given that some time has passed since we were called to isolate and maintain physical distancing, we may have forgotten some of the gifts of that time. But remember how we had time to really think about how we lived our lives before the pandemic? And ponder how we intended to live them once the pandemic was over? 
Well, now that the pandemic has been declared officially over, although COVID is still rampant in many parts of the world, how many of us have charged right back into living the frantic lives we once did? Perhaps it's time to remember the lessons that we learned during the time of COVID about what and who are truly important. What gifts are we going to hold on to? How are we going to live? My hope is that we will live as those who know that the Spirit dwells in each one of us, that we will recognize the Spirit of God in every person we encounter. I hope we will remember the importance of nurturing personal relationships with those we know well and love and with those we don't know so well. Our neighbors, perhaps the person who sits on the other side of the church that you've never really met, the person without a home that we walk by every time we go to the post office. I hope we will remember to appreciate and thank our health care providers, as Peter has, our first responders, the truck drivers who bring us our food, all those people we paid much more attention to during the pandemic. And I hope we will recognize the importance of life in community and recognize that Christ is truly present among us when we keep his commandments to love and serve one another. And may the Spirit, that great gift for each one of us, bind us together and sustain us in love. And remember, the Holy Spirit isn't only with you. The Holy Spirit is within you. Friends, know this. Neither those first disciples or any of us who follow Jesus walk this way of love alone. For beside us, within us, is the spirit of truth. And the truly good news is that we do not have to wait until heaven or God's reign comes on this earth to feel God with us because God's spirit, that spirit of truth, is with us and within us even now. Thanks be to God for this gift. Amen. Our hymn is Healer of Our Every Ill.
Before we offer our prayers for the world today, I have some rather sad news to share with you. Uh, Jim and Nancy Hamill this weekend uh, experienced the loss of their great-granddaughter who was um, still in utero. So we are, our hearts are with you and your family and upholding you at this time. Today, uh, our prayers will focus on families of all kinds, and we will be keeping Jim and Nancy and their family in special prayer. Let us pray. Oh God, we are so grateful for the way you care for us as a loving parent. We thank you for your promise never to leave us or forsake us, no matter where we find ourselves on the journey of life. We give thanks for families of all shapes and sizes, which provide such an important basis for love and support in our society. We give thanks for the joy and wonder of children that Jesus said we should strive to be like and whom we have so much to learn. We give thanks for parents who give so much of themselves to ensure that children feel loved and valued and we give thanks, too, for grandparents and other family members who so often help share some of the responsibilities of parenting and in return are able to share in its joys. We pray for families that are struggling to cope with the pressures they face. May they find courage and the support they need. We pray particularly for those who are caring for those they love in war zones for those in our own country as they flee before fires and floods in the West. For those families in Bangladesh and Myanmar who woke this morning in the midst of a cyclone. We pray for those who feel damaged or excluded from family life. May they feel the hand of friendship and love to feel included and supported as a family member. And God, we pray for those families who grieve today, who grieve the loss of life and the loss of hopes and dreams and possibilities. Be with them, walk alongside them, send your spirit to bring them peace. We pray for those who work with and support children and parents. May they in turn find support and encouragement. Give us all the strength to forgive family members who we feel have let us down, who have not lived up to our expectations or who have hurt us. Help us to love and pray for them unconditionally. We acknowledge the shortcomings in our own family life and commit ourselves to renew our commitment to self-giving love that enables both children and adults to feel cherished and supported. We pray for your support and your guidance in helping us to be better family members. We pray all these things in the name of the beloved Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray as we now say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The Apostle Paul declared that in God we live and move and have our being. We offer our gifts to God now in thanksgiving for all that we enjoy in life, praying that our generosity will be a blessing throughout all of God's precious creation. The offering will now be received.
O God, our creator and redeemer, you made us in love to share that love with neighbor and stranger as Jesus commanded and as Jesus showed us. Take these gifts and make them tokens of your love that we can share throughout our community and in this world you love. In Jesus' name, amen. Our final hymn is God of Grace and God of Glory, which is number 490 in the Book of Praise. And this is the one where we're singing <laughs> verses 1, 3, 4, and 5. <laughs> you to not forget to pick up your little flower before you leave us uh, today. Life is short and there is not much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk the way with us. So make haste to love, be swift to be kind, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>